the limits of debate in this country are established before the debate even begins, and everyone else is marginalized. They're made to seem either to be communists or was some sort of disloyal person, a kook, there's a word, and now it's conspiracy. See, they've made that something that should not be even entertained for a minute, that powerful people might get together and have a plan. Doesn't happen. You're a kook. You're a conspiracy buff. A short introduction. I grew up leading a wonderful life. A fan of action and academics, I was an honors high school graduate with the highest mark in history award at 92%. I earned a double major in history while pursuing my education and arts degrees in two universities. Professors asked me to publish some of my essays. The future was looking bright until I realized that it's not what you know and how you can explain it, but rather who you know that counts. I watched my friends get married, buy houses and start families, while I wondered how I was going to move out of my parents' house. I went back to school to study advanced woodworking and restart my career. It would take me a decade to realize that God had other plans for me. In June 2005, I had an awakening. While reading Matthew 24, I received the impression that what was being discussed in that passage could only be applied to events in our time. I searched Matthew 24 online to get other interpretations. One of those commentaries mentioned the word conspiracy. I was curious. I was instantly flooded with more than I could bear. For four sleepless days, I tried to disprove every aspect of what I saw. I couldn't. If my worldview was a computer operating system, it permanently crashed. I had to rebuild my paradigm. This was no easy task, as I had a lot invested. What you're about to see is a result of five years worth of reading of dozens of books, listening to hundreds of podcasts, and reading thousands of articles. This presentation has cost me at least $5,000, and I'm giving it away for free. Because I have invested as much time and concern on this project as others spend raising a child, I have occasionally been labeled obsessed. What these people don't realize is that I'm doing this for them. They don't want to see what I see, yet. I finally understand how someone like Adolf Hitler managed to fool the overwhelmingly Christian nation of Germany into believing that he was doing God's work. I now know that Adolf Hitler was a large part of an agenda that is so massive that it can't be fully described here. You had better care about this plan instead of sports or soap operas, because what happened to Germany during the Nazi era is happening to America and the West today. In a good two hours, you will learn the most important details of some aspects of what took me over two years to figure out. I don't know everything, but I know enough. Find out how to capture this presentation on your computer and make DVDs from it while we still have a free internet. Send me an email, especially if you decide to take up the offer at the end. Watch this presentation in a full screen window at the highest resolution that your internet connection can handle. Pause it to read the many quotations on the screen. Without knowing the past, you can't know the present or the future. This is why so much of this presentation is a very intense history lesson that you may need to watch several times to fully understand. Please be patient with it and watch it to the end. It does get to a point, which is this. There is hope for the future. Leonard Ulrich, March 2011. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge.
своем движении в другом направлении, к новому мировому порядку, I к think новой цивилизации. Even that does not describe why the world has changed so much and why the world has turned so much toward a new world order and a new kind of civilization. After 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order, and instead it looks like we got a lot of disorder. a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used I think only once and hasn't been used since and that is a new world order. This was a stirring address in my view, shorter than his father's speech when he announced the new world order. And it's only now that we can begin to understand that the world order that globalization brings and what it's going to look like, it's driven forward now not just by the balance of military strength, the Cold War times, or ordinary political power. It's being driven forward by a seismic shift in economic power that we see around us. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Thousands of people gathered to hear Barack Obama deliver key foreign policy speech on his current European tour. The Democratic presidential hopeful laid out his vision for America's place in a new world order, saying he was speaking as a proud citizen of the United States and a fellow citizen of the world. This film is about three big ideas. Most of the evil in this world is highly coordinated and is fulfilling biblical prophecy to the letter. Historical and current events are being influenced by evil to make the appearance of the Antichrist highly probable within a generation. Though the world is not yet in an apocalyptic state, the forces of organized evil affect us all now and must be resisted like never before. This film is unique in that it systematically studies the origins, activities, and destiny of evil. If you're a Christian, and even if you're not, you should keep watching in order to reduce the effects of evil. Presentations in this genre make all kinds of predictions about the future, most of which will turn out to be wrong. Instead of dwelling on the future, I'm going to survey the past. Once you know how we got here and then compare our present situation to what the Bible said would eventually happen, you might be interested in its solutions. If you think this is all fluff, then please consider the following question. If the Bible's explanation of evil is just a myth, then why are so many anti-Christians doing everything they can to fulfill that myth? Looks like we should study the New World Order. The New World Order is like a rope. That rope is made up of cords of political, military, economic, scientific, cultural, and religious power that has always been pulling the world to a definite conclusion away from God. Recently, that pull has been getting progressively stronger. Each cord of the New World Order rope is composed of people at the outer layers who have no idea what the ultimate goal of those at the center of each cord is. As people work their way to the center of each cord, the ultimate goal of those associated with the New World Order becomes clear. A one-world government, a one-world economy, a one-world military, a one-world society, and a one-world religion, all enforced with absolute control under a single world ruler. 
This goal is not democratic. In fact, most people will not want this goal to be pursued because it limits their freedom. In spite of popular resistance, this goal is being achieved through secrecy and progressive conditioning to make the public want this goal. There is plenty of evidence that this goal exists. Pat Robertson has written in a book a few years ago that we should have a world government, but only when the Messiah arrives. <laughs> he wrote, and literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. <laughs> the primary driver of the new world order is religion. After all, people act on what they believe. Financial control is the means by which the New World Order funds its primary tool, which is warfare. We must first understand the tool of warfare before we can grasp the matrix of control being applied to us. Once we understand these systems of control, we can then understand the belief systems of those who are controlling us. All this knowledge is necessary to form strategies of resistance to what you are probably not even aware of. But how did this mindset, control system, and tool of warfare get created? All secret societies trace their origins back to the ancient mystery religions practiced in Samaria, Egypt, and Babylon. These ancient mystery religions were responsible for keeping a closed population in total subservience to a small elite which were worshipped as gods or as intermediaries between the masses and the gods. Knowledge is power. If you know when the next solar eclipse is going to occur and others around you don't, you can demand a lot from a primitive society when you threaten to turn off the sun. People with secret knowledge of astronomy are going to try to keep that knowledge to themselves. The moment they share that knowledge, their power over any society is eliminated. Large groups of people can be held in check by belief systems given to them by a tiny elite which keeps a core of knowledge to itself. This is why the most powerful groups in any society operate in secret. In fact, the word occult does not mean evil. It means secret. You are not supposed to know the secrets of the elite. Once you discover and verify these secrets, you'll be shocked at how the elite control you. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength 
and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. While other cultures were practicing pantheism, the monotheism of the Israelites kept them unique. When the Israelites were true to their faith, they prospered. When they began to absorb the teachings and practices of the surrounding cultures, the Israelites became oppressed by the civilizations they had previously resisted. Those within Judaism who were tempted by the occult practices of the surrounding cultures became the vehicle by which secret societies continued right up to today. Practitioners of the occult within Judaism codified their beliefs in a sub-religion which became known as Kabbalah. On the surface, Kabbalism appears to be Judaism. In reality, it is the exact opposite of Judaism. The Kabbalah offers an occult counter-explanation to the revelations of the Jewish prophets and the history of the Israelites. The Kabbalah depicts Moses as an occult figure whose purpose was to initiate the Israelites back into the more enlightened and advanced teachings of Egypt. We must grasp this if we are to understand much of what is happening in Israel today. We must also understand that the teachings of all secret societies flow through the Kabbalah. A girlfriend of mine go, used to, was going all the time and, um, to these classes. They're classes. It's a, the Kabbalah mm -hmm. Learning Center. And basically the Kabbalah is the mystical interpretation of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And she kept telling me about this really charismatic um, rabbi named Eitan who said, told these great stories and she kept going on and on about it and, you know, and I said, listen, I'm, Susan, I'm not even Jewish. Why are you telling me these things? You know, and she's like, you don't have to be Jewish. Just come and take a, you know, study and if you, if you like it, well, you like it. If you don't, yeah. leave. So I did. Those of you who have not learned or sent all the deep things of Satan, I know your works, but I have this against you. The emergence of Christianity during the height of the Roman era became a problem for the Romans. The more the Roman government tried to suppress Christianity, the more Christianity grew. Please remember that the next time somebody tries to tell you that religion is just a tool of control. Because the Roman government couldn't eliminate Christianity, it eventually decided to merge its belief system with it. The moral decline of the early church can be traced back to the time when Constantine decided to become a Christian for whatever reason. The beliefs of the Babylonians, Egyptians, Greeks, Eastern cultures, and Romans infiltrated much of Christianity as the Roman government merged with Christianity. At the heart of this infiltration was Gnosticism. Gnosticism means salvation through knowledge, while Christianity means salvation through Christ. Gnosticism has always been the primary driver of the New World Order. A military and religious order known as the Knights Templar was created in Jerusalem in 1118 by nine French knights. Their official mission was to protect pilgrims on their journey to the Holy Land during the Crusades and they participated in several battles in the Crusades themselves. The name Knights Templar was applied to this group when Baldwin II, King of Jerusalem, 
gave this group of knights lodging in his palace built on the ruins of King Solomon's temple. By 1128, the order was given special protection by the Pope. As the Crusades wore on, the Knights Templar set up offices in Christian countries to encourage enlistment. The Knights Templar were a tax-exempt organization and received donations from crusading pilgrims in exchange for protection to and from Jerusalem. Because its membership remained dominated by the nobility, the Knights Templar were granted many favors by European rulers. Through gifts of land and money, the Knights Templar became extremely wealthy and powerful. The Knights Templar degenerated to the point where they practiced idolatry, sex rituals, and worshipped Satan in the form of the Baphomet. In fact, sodomy became a rite of initiation into the order. Unfortunately, those practices are being carried on today. And if Washington doesn't have enough to talk about these days, the Washington Times reported today that unidentified White House aides in the Carter, Reagan, and Bush administrations now are being investigated for using the services of a callboy ring. The paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late-night tour of the White House last year. The White House press secretary, Marlon Fitzwater, said he knew nothing of this investigation. NBC's Lisa Myers reports her sources in the U.S. Attorney's Office say the investigation is not focusing on prostitution, but on fraud involving the use of credit cards to pay for the callboy services. Pope Clement V resisted abolishment of the Knights Templar for years. Finally, after waves of public pressure, most notably from King Philip IV of France, the Pope ordered 54 Templars burned alive in Paris as punishment for conspiracy and Satan worship. The order was destroyed when the Grand Master of the Knights Templar, Jacques de Molay, was burned at the stake on March 18, 1314. Many of the Knights Templar fled to Scotland, Portugal, and to the island of Malta. Some of today's well-connected youth are still initiated into a secret society based on the Knights Templar, known as the Order of de Molay. The Rosicrucians were a religious order that combined the beliefs of ancient mystery religions with Christianity. It is not known whether the Rosicrucians were founded independently of the Knights Templar. At some point, these two groups merged and became one. After the Knights Templar were abolished, the Rosicrucians became the key vehicle by which occult teachings were spread throughout Europe. This has also been the case in much of the Jesuit order as it led the Counter-Reformation. The occult teachings of the Rosicrucians, rooted in the Kabbalah, had a big impact on recent history. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Freemasonry started when the Rosicrucians merged with the Stonemason guilds of Europe. From the 1640s onwards, as the construction of grand cathedrals declined, Masons concentrated less on stonework and more on occult teachings. By 1717, the world's first Grand Lodge of Freemasonry was established in London. Freemasons were initially viewed positively by the public for doing good works, and the number of lodges grew rapidly throughout Europe. The age-old satanic desire for power also grew within Freemasonry. A secret society within a secret society, made up of only the highest levels of Freemasons, fathered a ruthless philosophy that is affecting us to this day. On May 1st, 1776, the Order of the Illuminati was born.
the Illuminati were a perfect storm of Freemasonic, banking, and religious interests. If you are truly interested in separating fact from fiction, what remains as fact about the Illuminati from original sources is most disturbing. By reading Robeson's Proof of a Conspiracy, the goals of the Illuminati become clear. Abolition of all monarchical government and patriotism to it. Elimination of private property and inheritance. Destruction of the traditional family. And eradication of all religion. The effects of the Illuminati cannot be overemphasized. Over 5,000 years of occult history have been focused into the Illuminati. Around 250 years of occult practices have flowed from the Illuminati. The modern financial system was invented by the Illuminati. Communism was invented by the Illuminati. The new age and propaganda movements designed to affect your mind were invented by the Illuminati. There is not an area in your life that has not been affected by the Illuminati. Every major war, from the French Revolution onwards, has been influenced by Illuminati philosophy to progressively promote a one-world government. The Illuminati were headed up by Adam Weishaupt. Though Weishaupt had a Jewish lineage, he was educated in a Jesuit school. He graduated with a Doctor of Law degree from the University of Ingolstadt in 1768. With his family's rejection of Judaism and his Jesuit training which he regretted, Weishaupt looked to himself to create his own religion and twisted vision of how man should be governed. At first, Weishaupt had only a few disciples who met locally at Weishaupt's apartment in Ingolstadt, Germany. To my knowledge, this is the only presentation to prove the physical origins of the Illuminati. From this upper room, an evil philosophy was born. Weishaupt was initiated into the Masonic Lodge of Theodore of Good Counsel in Munich in 1777. Through his growing associations with Freemasons, priests, preachers, professors, dukes, colonels, and counts, Weishaupt worked to weave the Illuminati into the rope of Freemasonry. By late 1781, an agreement was reached to combine the two orders so that no one could tell where Freemasonry stopped and the Illuminati began. In 1782, over 2,000 participants attended the Masonic Congress of Wilhelmsbad which became the power base of the Illuminati. The House of Rothschild was on its way to becoming the most powerful banking family in the world. Mayor Amchal Bauer, a Jewish coin dealer of humble origins, changed his name to M. A. Rothschild when he realized that his success as an emerging power banker was based on the occult. To celebrate this fact in the occult tradition, he placed a red shield in front of his banking house which incorporated a hexagram. The family crest has evolved over time, but maintains this element within it to this day. Rothschild sponsored the 1782 Illuminati Congress of Wilhelmsbad. Despite their best efforts at necessary secrecy, the Illuminati were exposed in 1784 by the Bavarian government, which soon issued an edict banning all secret societies. The workings of the order were contained in writings seized by the Bavarian government, which took them so seriously as to publish them in an official document entitled The Original Writings of the Order of the Illuminati, which was distributed to the major governments of Europe. Some members of the Illuminati were arrested, while most fled Bavaria under the edict. This only spread Illuminati philosophy further throughout Europe. Adam Weishaupt went underground and re-emerged under the sponsorship of Duke Ernst II of saxe coburg altenburg where he would continue to write books on the Illuminati until his death. The third chord in the Illuminati rope of control was Jewish revolutionary heresy. Shabbatai Tzvi calculated that the Messiah would come back in 1666. When that didn't pan out, Shabbatai taught that he was a Messiah. Shabbatai would later convert to Islam. Jakob Frank thought that the Messiah would return based on tolerating a finite amount of sin. His main idea is that sin should be promoted and practiced wherever possible so that the Messiah would come back sooner. Eventually, Frank also taught that he was a Messiah and that he was a successor to Shabbatai Tzvi. We need to know all this because the revolutionary Frankists were a large group of over one million Jews 
and some Frankists were involved in the French Revolution. With his rejection of traditional Judaism and embrace of the occult, Rothschild welcomed Frankism. When Jakob Frank visited Frankfurt, he became instantly wealthy with Rothschild money. When the French Revolution was over, the Frankists scattered in Poland and Bohemia, intermarried into the gentry and middle class, and took on the appearance of Christianity. You need to know about the Frankists for two reasons. First, many prominent American politicians appear as moderates, but have a family tree rooted in Eastern European Jewish revolutionary heresy. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. You'll be surprised to learn that several key Middle Eastern politicians also share these roots. Second, so many people of Jewish background in Hollywood carry on the Frankist tradition today through constant promotion of sin and the occult. The hand of the Illuminati was shaped by Jewish revolutionary heresy. This hand fit perfectly inside the glove made of Freemasonic fabric, which held the Rothschild money that empowered it. Scattered from Bavaria, the Illuminati quickly re-emerged in France within pre-existing revolutionary groups, the largest of which was the Jacobin Club. The Jacobins, with the money from the Duke of Orleans, bought up and transported out much of the grain supply in France to create an artificial food shortage in 1789. The famine that resulted drove people to revolt. The Jacobins told the people to blame the famine on King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette. The fate of that French monarchy was sealed in the minds of the public when it was alleged that Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake in response to the famine. Jacobin propaganda pinned this saying on Antoinette to create maximum hatred for the monarchy. It worked. The hatred of all authority in the French Revolution did not stop with the execution of the French king and queen in 1793. By the time the six successive waves of the French Revolution had passed, over 18,000 people had been guillotined without trial. Decapitated heads of the nobility were stuck on bayonets and paraded throughout the streets. The Christian calendar was abolished. The work week was lengthened to 10 days straight. By the time the French Revolution burnt itself out, it is estimated that this program killed 300,000 people, all in the name of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The world's first Luciferian revolution, guided by the Illuminati, was complete. to cheat the tax collector before my own children. Do you think I want to do that? I live honestly, I trade honestly, I want to be honest with them, but they won't let us. We are Jews, taxed to death, forbidden to learn a trade, forbidden to own land. They keep us in chains, they send men here to rob us. So work and strive for money. Money is power. Money is the only weapon that the Jew has to defend himself with. Oh, never. Though Mayor Amschel Rothschild died in Frankfurt in 1812, his empire grew through his family. Perhaps the one quote in modern English which sums up Mayor Rothschild's ambitions is this, Give me control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. 
Towards the end of his life, Mayer told his five sons that they should expand the Rothschild banking empire throughout Europe. Nathan was sent to London. Amschel stayed in Frankfurt. Solomon went to Vienna. Karl traveled to Naples. James stayed in Paris. The establishment of the five centers of the Rothschild banking family is symbolized by the five arrows in the Rothschild family crest. The alliance between the Rothschilds and the Lubinized Freemasonry continued with this new generation. Freemasonry was a common element with Adam Weishaupt, three of the five Rothschild brothers, and Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon was initiated into Freemasonry in June 1798. Napoleon was part of the Inner Masonic Club, but his imperialist ambitions could not be contained. Keep in mind that Napoleon appointed himself as King of France in December 1804. Napoleon enjoyed immense success as Emperor of France, yet his policies contained a fatal flaw. Napoleon's Bank de France, which would provide interest-free loans to the people of France, was a direct threat to the Rothschild banking empire. The Rothschilds decided to defeat Napoleon's army, not through military conquest, but by financial dominance. Napoleon needed so much money to finance his war that he agreed to sell all French territory in America through the Louisiana Purchase of 1804. Nathan Rothschild in England took Prince William's money transferred to Amschel Rothschild in Germany and used it to fund British forces. Jacob Rothschild in France was one of several banks helping to fund Napoleon's army. This means that the Rothschilds were busy funding both sides of the War of 1812. The modern financial system started by the Rothschilds has been funding both sides of every major war for 200 years. While the Battle of Waterloo was a defeat for Napoleon, it was also a guarantee of financial domination for the Rothschilds. Because the Rothschilds had a network of banking couriers throughout Europe, they were the only merchants allowed to pass through the English and French blockades. One of these couriers crossed the English Channel with the news that Wellington had won the war a full 24 hours before Wellington's own courier. Nathan Rothschild knew that he was armed with this critical information before anyone else was. He ordered his workers to start selling holdings of British war bonds. Other traders observed this false maneuver and started selling their bonds in a panic. The bonds became worthless as everyone thought that Rothschild's action meant that Napoleon had won the war. Nathan Rothschild then instructed his traders to buy all the British bonds they could get. When London heard the news that England won the war against Napoleon, British bonds gained a level of value even higher than before the war began. The ownership of such a vast sum of high-value bonds meant that the Rothschilds literally owned the Bank of England. On top of all this, there were the profits to be made from loans to Europe to repair the damage done by Napoleon. From the Battle of Waterloo onwards, the interests of the British Crown and the Rothschilds were so intertwined that the Rothschilds were given titles of nobility. Eventually, through intermarriage, the Rothschilds became royalty. Following the Napoleonic Wars, the Illuminati thought that the nations of Europe would be so tired of fighting that they would agree to enter into a federation. Switzerland was declared to be a neutral country into which member kingdoms could deposit their money. Since the post-Napoleonic nations of Europe were heavily indebted to the Rothschilds, it could be argued that the Congress made Switzerland act as the modern version of the Knights Templar for the past 200 years. Now you know why Switzerland has acted as Europe's untouched bank during the European slaughters of World War I and World War II. The Congress of Vienna resulted in a treaty. Russian Tsar Alexander I opposed this treaty because he saw the Congress as an Illuminati takeover. The Rothschilds vowed that the Romanov dynasty would someday come to an end. Columbus did not discover anything. The Vikings arrived in North America 500 years before Columbus did. Manly P. Hall, the most prolific Masonic author of all time, wrote a compact book in 1944 entitled 
the secret destiny of America. It confirms that the Old World knew about the New World for thousands of years. Columbus sailed to the West because his family and those who paid for his expedition were steeped in Rosicrucianism and wished to lay the foundation of a New World Order. One only has to look at the cipher used in his signature for proof of this claim. Much of the occult knowledge of the Knights Templar is carved in stone in Scotland's Rossland Chapel. The carvings that line the inner frame above this window are of maize or of Indian corn that grew only in the New World. How could this be if the construction of the Rossland Chapel began in 1446 or 46 years before Columbus sailed to the west? For the answer to this question, we should look at the sails on the ships used by Columbus. They were adorned with the logo of the Knights Templar. From before the time of Columbus until today, America has always had a special place in the plans of the New World Order. The Illuminati in Europe saw the rare positive outcome of the American Revolution and sought to subvert it through the Columbian Lodge of the Order of the Illuminati, established in New York in 1785. Agents of the Illuminati worked to start a new revolution in America so that America would resemble France without the Napoleonic influence. Most of America's founding fathers were deists. They believed in God, but as they, and not the Bible, defined God. The level of Gnosticism that the founding fathers of America were involved in ranges from mild to severe. George Washington never defined his faith in his own writings. He was also a Freemason. He helped design the street plan of Washington, D.C., which is laid out according to Masonic symbology. Thomas Jefferson also talked about God, but rejected the Bible. In fact, Jefferson wrote his own New Testament, deleting passages and cutting out entire books like the Book of Revelation, which didn't agree with him. Benjamin Franklin talked about God, but rejected traditional Christianity. What is particularly disturbing about Benjamin Franklin is his membership in the Hellfire Club in London. In the late 1700s, a group of Englishmen formed the first Hellfire Club, a fraternity dedicated to drinking, sex, and at times, ridiculing Christianity and mocking its sacred rituals. Members met at ruined monasteries to revel in black masses and drunken orgies. An occasional participant was the American ambassador to Great Britain, Benjamin Franklin. Whether or not any of these American leaders are Christian is not for me to decide. The singular point being made here is that America has always had a thick Christian veneer applied to a Gnostic core. Over time, that occult core has grown and the Christian veneer has worn thin. In 1791, Alexander Hamilton established the first privately owned central bank in the United States with $10 million on a 20-year charter. This is contrary to the United States Constitution, which Hamilton signed. When the charter expired, the head of this private group was revealed. None other than Nathan Rothschild in England said, either the application for the renewal of the charter is granted, or the United States will find itself in a most disastrous war. The United States repelled the British on American soil within one year of Nathan Rothschild's pronouncement during the War of 1812. Fortunately for America, Britain was tied up fighting Napoleon in Europe and couldn't send enough troops to reclaim America. While America won a military victory, its financial back was broken. The War of 1812 forced the rechartering of the private bank of the United States. Thanks to the war and inflation, the debt owed to the bank exploded to $127 million. Andrew Jackson vetoed the bank in 1832. In 1835, President Jackson distributed a $35 million surplus. This was the only time in American history that the United States had balanced its books. The Rothschilds had their sights set on reclaiming America. A divide-and-conquer strategy would be used by creating a conflict between the North and the South. The North was to be a British colony annexed to Canada under the control of Lionel Rothschild. The South was to be a French colony given to Napoleon III of France under the control of James Rothschild. 
Lincoln's main problem shifted from slavery, which he outlawed, to how he was going to pay for the defense of America against the international bankers who were destroying it. Lincoln came up with a brilliant solution called the greenback. The government would print its own interest-free currency that would later be redeemable in gold. The bankers wouldn't stand for this. On April 14, 1865, five days after the South surrendered, Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. Booth was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. The monarchies of Europe, led by the British royal family, had been involved in the occult for centuries through the sponsorship of clairvoyance. The British royal family is deeply Masonic. The Queen's cousin, the Duke of Kent, is British Freemasonry's Grand Master. There is even a Freemasonic Lodge in Buckingham Palace. Though the current Queen is not amused at this, her predecessors were often Masonic. It is a fact that much of the European nobility goes back to various houses, especially in England and France, which link the lines of the kings of England and the kings of Jerusalem. Fiction occurs when this link is used to create a mythology which states that the British people, led by their monarch, are one of the lost tribes of Israel. British Israel Freemasons also believe that since America was descendant from Britain, Americans who are of British Masonic descent are also one of the lost tribes of Israel. On the back of the US $1 bill, there exists a Star of David hidden in plain sight. The British royal family is more German than it is English. Queen Victoria was married to Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. Under pressure from anti-German sentiment created during World War I, King George V changed his family name to Windsor. When Princess Elizabeth wanted to marry Prince Philip of the House of schleswig holstein sonderburg glucksburg she faced the same problem that King George did. Prince Philip renounced his titles and adopted the surname of Mountbatten. All four of Prince Philip's sisters married into the German nobility, which embraced Nazi philosophy. Remember that Adam Weishaupt wrote more material on the Illuminati under the sponsorship of Duke Ernst II of saxe coburg altenburg which is the same region of Germany that the British royal family comes from. Given all the evidence of the British royal family's ties to the occult, Freemasonry, and their German heritage, it is not hard to see that the teachings of Adam Weishaupt are being used by the British royal family today. The British monarchy was involved in two wars with China over opium. From about the mid-17th century onwards, Europe had a huge trade deficit with China. Europe wanted Chinese tea, silk and porcelain, but China did not want as much of what Europe had to offer. This trade deficit problem was made worse by the fact that Chinese emperors demanded to be paid in silver and gold coin. The problem was solved when British traders began importing opium into China from India. Large areas of China became addicted to opium. The addiction was so intense that in many areas of China, opium was currency. The conflict between the Chinese emperors and British traders grew so bad that Queen Victoria sent in the British army to fight the Chinese army over opium in 1839 to 1842 and again in 1846 to 1860. When you are told that the British royal family's wealth is based on taxation, don't believe it. It could be argued that the British East India Company occupied India on behalf of the British Crown and its traders. Afghanistan is occupied today by coalition forces. In 2007, 93% of the world's opium production came from Afghanistan. The 2006 Afghan opium harvest was also valued at $3 billion. Ahmad Wali Karzai, brother of Afghan President Hamid Karzai, is intimately linked with the export of opium from Afghanistan. He is also on the CIA payroll.
Uh, the Taliban lend the farmers the money. They are indebted to the Taliban. They have to grow the opium. Now the Marines, in their success, are in a sense a victim of their success because now the population is, uh, you know, they have these opium fields and we are tolerating it. We are tolerating the cultivation of the opium because we know that if we were to destroy it now, the population would turn against the Marines and it would be a real security risk. The Taliban finances much of its operations by selling opium, which is grown from poppies, which are right now being harvested. So here's the question. Why are American troops now helping Afghan farmers grow that opium? Nick Schifrin reports from Afghanistan on a controversial new policy. In one case, they even paid a farmer $1,000 after U.S. and Afghan special forces burned his crop. If you can come down to the base on my next visit, I will, I'll make a payment. The Round Table Groups are the most influential and interconnected secret societies in the Western world. While Cecil Rhodes did not start any of these groups, he was instrumental in ensuring that they worked together toward a common goal. In 1966, Georgetown University history professor Carol Quigley defined this goal in a massive work entitled Tragedy and Hope. One of the members of the Round Table Groups sponsored Carol Quigley who was given access to their secret records to produce what the group thought would be an internal publication. As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship. And then as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley, who said to us that America was the greatest nation in history because our people have always believed in two things, that tomorrow can be better than today, and that every one of us has a personal, moral responsibility to make it so. Soon after Adam Weishaupt died, Italian patriot Giuseppe Mazzini was appointed to be the head of the Illuminati in 1834. Mazzini became a 33rd degree Mason while attending Genoa University. The most important thing about Mazzini is that he formalized the Mafia. The name Mafia is an acronym which stands for Mazzini Autofizia Ferti Incendi and Evolemeni or Mazzini Authorizes Thefts, Fires and Poisonings. With the wave of Italian immigration to America starting in the 1890s, the practices of the Mafia merged with the Illuminati of America. Next to Adam Weishaupt, Albert Pike is the most influential Freemason in history. Pike was asked by American Freemasons to reform its rituals. He did so in a Masonic handbook entitled Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Rite of Freemasonry, published in 1871. The Knights of the Golden Circle, or KGC, was a Masonic organization dedicated to establishing a golden circle of territories between Mexico, Central America, the Caribbean, and the Southern States, which would officially sanction slavery. Albert Pike was associated with the KGC and created several spin-off groups from it, including the Ku Klux Klan. While he was Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, Albert Pike created his own office of Chief Justice of the KKK. This is also borne out at the location of his statue, which is in Judiciary Square in Washington, D.C. Albert Pike is responsible for inflaming racial tensions that were the official cause of the U.S. Civil War. Now you can understand how the American Civil War was really about who would control the money supply of the United States and that slavery was a secondary issue in this conflict. William Huntington Russell was one of the more prominent merchants involved in the Chinese opium trade. Born in America, Russell did what most wealthy businessmen did during the Industrial Revolution, protect his assets from taxation by establishing a tax-free foundation. The tax-free foundation that Russell and company established based on opium revenue 
was the Russell Trust. The key institution of indoctrination that Russell Trust established was Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones was founded at Yale University in 1832 as a Black Lodge of Freemasonry. The odds that both presidential candidates would happen to be members of Skull and Bones is approximately 1 in 750,000. Three generations of the Bush family have been members of Skull and Bones. George W. Bush, his father George H. W. Bush, and his father before him, Prescott Bush, were all members of this occult secret society. The videotape provides a grainy glimpse into what appear to be the initiation rituals of a secret society that's been around since 1832, whose members have gone on to be leaders of Wall Street and the White House, the Senate and the Supreme Court. They're sort of trying to scare the initiates, make them, uh, you know, disorient them, frighten them. New York Observer investigative reporter Ron Rosenbaum accompanied a team of Yale students who shot these pictures nine days ago. Rosenbaum's curiosity about Skull and Bones was permanently piqued when, as a classmate of George W. Bush, he lived right next to the tomb, the group's heavily fortified home. From their perch, Rosenbaum and his cohorts taped the tomb's courtyard. What they captured, they say, was initiates, known as neophytes, being forced to kiss a skull, then members performing a mock killing. It may look like your average fraternity nonsense, but Rosenbaum says it's not. Even though it may seem silly to us, it seems to mean something to them, and you can't argue with the success of Skull and Bones. It has been alleged by members of Skull and Bones that it was Prescott Bush who stole the skull and bones of Indian Chief Geronimo and placed it in the tomb as a source of spiritual power. George W. Bush never apologized for his activities in Skull and Bones. One of the first things he did as president was appoint many of his fellow bonesmen to positions of power. President Bush has tapped five fellow bonesmen to join his administration. Most recently, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, William Donaldson, Skull and Bones, 1953. Does that relationship forged with all this mumbo jumbo and coffins and skulls and bones and all of that stuff, does that become, in some cases anyway, stronger than family, faith? Absolutely. You know, they say they say the motto at Yale is for God, for country, and for Yale. At bones, it's I would think it's for bones. Georg Hegel was a German philosopher who came up with a basic system for achieving the goals of the Illuminati called the Hegelian dialectic. This system is based on three steps. In step one, a rogue government will create the problem that harms or even kills its own citizens. This deception is known as a false flag attack. In step two, a rogue government will control the reaction to the problem which it created by typically blaming it on an enemy or some aspect of its own society over which it seeks more control. This is why the term false flag attack is so named. In step three, a rogue government will offer the solution to the problem which it created. This solution is typically a war or a system of regulations. The solution would usually not be accepted by the public had the rogue government not created the crisis and control the reaction to it in the first place. A government which seeks increasing control can keep pushing society to accept its agenda by following a series of problems, reactions, and solutions which it planned all along. The significance of the Hegelian dialectic is not how evil it is, but rather how often governments choose to follow it. There has not been a major war in the 20th and 21st centuries that does not follow the Hegelian dialectic. Though his family converted to Christianity, Karl Marx became a Satanist during his university years. In a poem entitled Pale Maiden, Marx wrote, Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. Over time, 
Marx became a 32nd degree Mason. Karl Marx met up with German philosopher Friedrich Engels. Engels joined a revolutionary group 10 years earlier founded by Giuseppe Mazzini. It was Engels who would feed Karl Marx physically and intellectually for life. Marx published the Communist Manifesto in 1848 based on a draft from Engels. The manifesto was commissioned by the Communist League in London whose history can be traced back to the Jacobin Club and the Illuminati. The foundations of communism are identical to the goals of the Illuminati. Karl Marx was always looking for money. He found it when Nathan Rothschild gave Marx several thousand pounds to finance the cause of socialism through the Hegelian dialectic. Marx wrote Das Kapital in 1867, which became known as the Bible of the working class. While his Bible called for the working class to rise up and overthrow the financial bourgeoisie, Marx evidently did not practice what he preached. In an 1864 letter to his uncle, Marx announced that he made 400 pounds on the stock exchange. Nikolai Lenin picked up where Karl Marx left off. Lenin admired Mikhail Bakunin who wrote, The evil one is the satanic revolt against divine authority. Satan, the eternal rebel, the first free thinker and the emancipator of worlds. While attending university, Lenin became a Mason. Stopped by Andrew Jackson and delayed by Abraham Lincoln, the international bankers finally seized control of the financial system of the United States. On December 23, 1913, the Federal Reserve Act passed through Congress when most congressmen were home for Christmas. President Wilson promised to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign contributions. This unconstitutional act allowed a private group of international bankers to print pieces of paper as money which would be loaned out to the government at interest. Leading directly or indirectly through their agents, the most prominent members of this group were J.P. Morgan, J.D. Rockefeller, Jacob Schiff, and Max and Paul Warburg. Every member of this group was connected in different ways to the Rothschilds. The international bankers wasted little time in doing what they do best, finance wars. The bankers of Europe and America found a way to ignite the growing tension between Germany and the Anglo-American establishment for the economic and cultural dominance of Europe. Most people know that the flashpoint of World War I along the Western Front was the torpedoing of the Lusitania on May 7, 1915. What most people don't know is how the operations of the Lusitania were engineered to provoke this war. British intelligence broke the German war code in December 1914. This meant that the first Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, knew where every German U-boat was in the English Channel. The Lusitania slowed to await the arrival of its military escort through the channel. Churchill ordered the escort to return to port. The Lusitania was crawling alone through a war zone. A private letter from Churchill removes any doubt as to whether he intended for the Lusitania to be sunk. Roughly 1,200 people lost their lives in an engineered event designed to start a war. The Germans claimed that the Lusitania was carrying arms from America to be used by Britain against Germany. Ninety-three years later, this claim has been proven to be true. The English-speaking press, controlled by the CFR in America and the Rothschild-owned news services in Europe, published the claim that the barbaric Germans had attacked an unarmed passenger ship. This ignores the fact that the German government placed warnings in New York newspapers reminding passengers that the ship would be sailing into a war zone. The best example of how the Illuminati bankers funded both sides of World War I was given through Max and Paul Warburg. Paul Warburg's firm of Kuhn, Loeb & Company was in charge of Liberty Loans which helped finance the American military. Max Warburg's firm of M.M. Warburg & Company helped finance the German military. 
The Rothschilds were unable to control Russia because of the Tsar until World War I when the alliance between the European and American bankers was complete. Jacob Schiff spent $20 million in gold to finance the Russian Revolution through Leon Trotsky, who was exiled in style in New York. Of the 384 commissars that were to make up the new Russian government, 264 had come from the United States. When the ship carrying the men and materials for the revolution were seized at the port of Halifax by Canadian authorities, President Wilson secured their release by stating that if they weren't let go, the U.S. would not enter the war. Lenin, exiled in Switzerland, promised to make peace with Germany if he overthrew Russia's temporary government. He was placed in a sealed railway car with five million dollars in German gold and was sent to Russia. When the elections were held in November 1917, Lenin's communists received only 24 percent of the vote. Lenin had to use force in order to represent the people. The United States stepped in with enormous amounts of food and relief supplies as famine gripped Russia while Lenin took control of it. This opened the door for American industrialists and financiers like J.D. Rockefeller to build the infrastructure of Russia. The net effect was that America continued to support the communist revolution. This support was extended as power was transferred from Lenin to Stalin in spite of Stalin's ruthlessness. World War I ended according to the master plan of the 20th century Illuminati financiers. They knew that communism could only continue so long as capitalism supported it. The financiers also knew that the oppressive chains of the Treaty of Versailles would be broken by a leader who would eventually rise up from within Germany. Welcome to the first round of Problem, Reaction and Solution. As the Industrial Revolution progressed, several captains of industry emerged in America. Andrew Carnegie made his fortune in steel production. Henry Ford excelled at making cars. John D. Rockefeller made the largest fortune in America through banking based on oil production. Many have speculated that the CFR is an acronym based on Carnegie, Ford and Rockefeller. While this may not be the case, all three of these men have had a financial stake in the CFR, which was officially formed in New York in July 1921. Its logo features a rider on a white horse giving a Masonic salute. The Latin word in the logo means everywhere. The CFR in New York is the counterpart to the Royal Institute in London. Both groups are members of the round table groups. The same bankers which established the Federal Reserve in 1913 funded the CFR through dozens of tax-free foundations. If you want to catch a ride in the Anglo-American machinery of the Illuminati today, you will agree to be told what to do. It's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. <laughs> The goal of the Royal Institute and the CFR is nothing less than one world government. In 1950, CFR member James Warburg testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and said, We shall have world government, whether or not you like it, by conquest or consent. You would think that the CFR would be the talk of the American mainstream media, but the CFR dictates what will make the American news and how it will be presented to reporters in key positions who are along for the establishment ride. Following World War I, the League of Nations was the first popular attempt at creating a world government. 
the League was promoted as the way of providing a collective security since an attack on any one member of the League would be considered an attack on all. The League failed as an organization but acted as a successful stepping stone for the globalists. The League of Nations allowed the international bankers like J.D. Rockefeller to give more loans to more nations provided the international bankers control the banking system of that nation. When the Bank for International Settlements was established in 1930, the Illuminati financiers gained more control of the world's money supply. This was all the more reason to start World War II. We must understand political Zionism up to World War I if we are to understand the entire foundation of the 20th century. Austrian Jew Theodor Herzl published a book in 1896 entitled The Jewish State. It proposed a Jewish state to cure the problem of anti-Semitism. The Rothschilds founded the Zionist Federation of Great Britain in 1897 to promote political Zionism with Theodor Herzl as president. We must stop our survey of political Zionism at this point to carefully define it. Political Zionism is the social movement which creates and sustains the physical nation of Israel. This definition is in the present tense because the territory of Israel is in a state of flux. Political Zionism is also the driver for world government through Israel in the tradition of the heretical Frankist Jews. This definition is embodied by the Rothschild family. Not all Jews are political Zionists. Not all political Zionists are Jews. The political Zionist movement feeds off Jews in the same way that the Nazi movement fed off Germans. Political Zionism is the greatest enemy of the Jews. Political Zionism is the ultimate dialectic, and Theodore Herzl understood this. I must warn you. What you are about to hear is truly evil. It is essential that the sufferings of the Jews become worse. This will assist in the realization of our plans. I have an excellent idea. I shall induce the anti-Semites to liquidate Jewish wealth. The anti-Semites will assist us thereby in that they will strengthen the persecution and opposition of the Jews. The anti-Semites shall be our best friends. Frankism is the basis of political Zionism which expressed itself in the Russian Revolution. Karl Marx's real name was Moses Mordecai Levy. Vladimir Lenin was born Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, which is of Jewish lineage. Leon Trotsky's real name was Lev Davidovich Bronstein. The Rothschilds finally succeeded in making good on the threat to remove the Romanov dynasty from power through the Frankist Bolsheviks they controlled. Adolf Hitler was offered as the manufactured solution to the burden imposed upon Germany by the Treaty of Versailles. The event Hitler created to take control of Germany was engineered through a false flag attack. We now know that Hitler had his henchmen set fire to the German parliament, known as the Reichstag, in 1933. The fire was blamed on communist agent Marinus van der Lubbe in a huge show trial. In reality, van der Lubbe was a mentally handicapped individual picked up off the streets. Hitler's mighty war machine was funded and created by Wall Street. The Treaty of Versailles induced Germany to default on its debt. The Dawes Plan replaced the treaty after five years and allowed links to be made between American and German industry and finance. From the mid-1920s to the late 1930s, through the Bank of International Settlements, over $135 million was loaned to the German electrical, steel, and chemical industries from Wall Street. The profits on these loans were considerable. Without the technology for extracting petroleum from the German coal fields supplied by Rockefeller-owned Standard Oil of New Jersey, the Nazi war machine would have ran out of gas. One of the funders of the Nazi war machine was Prescott Bush, father and grandfather of two U.S. presidents. According to files from the U.S. National Archives, 
Prescott Bush was a partner in Brown Brothers Harriman. This was one of the corporations used by industrialist Fritz Thiessen to move assets between America and Germany. Prescott Bush's assets in Union Banking Corporation were seized under the Trading with the Enemy Act in 1942, after America entered the war. The Bush family fortune was built in part from funding the very enemy that would kill over 400,000 American troops. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Prescott Bush, United States Senator from Connecticut. I, I think we have made, in the, just in this year, a very marked and noticeable progress in connection with the Cold War. Included in that, too, should be uh, our efforts to uh, get at this subversion business within our own government. The ideologies of the Nazis and the Communists were set against each other by the Illuminati financiers in a dialectical struggle. Both ideologies are flawed and use the same means to produce the same result. The Illuminati financiers chose to eliminate the Nazi movement and preserve Communism for one very important reason. Hitler started to print money just like the Federal Reserve. At this point, all of Europe was tied up in war with itself. The problem and reaction stages of World War II would only be solved through America. America entered World War II based on the Pearl Harbor attack that was allowed to happen and deliberately made worse. The Japanese signals indicating the time, place and resources to be used in the attack were remotely intercepted and sent to President Roosevelt. President Roosevelt chose not to relay the information to Pearl Harbor. America now had the excuse to attack Germany, even though Germany never attacked America. The Japanese were ready to surrender in February 1945, but two nuclear bombs were dropped on them after this date instead of being used in Europe. The madness of World War II accomplished several things for the Illuminati financiers. Profits could be generated by rebuilding Japan and using it to provide cheap labor to flood America with inexpensive goods. This would accelerate the long-term planned process of bringing down America just as China is being used to help finish the job today. Communism was allowed to consume half of Europe in order to lock America and the Soviet Union in a new dialectical struggle and a new opportunity for profit. Most importantly, World War II paved the way to create the United Nations and the Nation of Israel. It must be noted that the top four players of World War II had ties to the occult. Hitler was deeply involved in the black arts. He joined a group focused on esoteric teachings called the Thule Society. This is where the logo for the Nazi party came from. The occult foundation of Nazi philosophy was laid by Dietrich Eckhart not by Adolf Hitler. Joseph Stalin was involved in Freemasonry. Here we see him giving the same sign of the hidden hand, the same hand sign of Freemasons Napoleon and Solomon Rothschild. Franklin Roosevelt was a 32nd degree Mason. Winston Churchill was a member of two Masonic lodges, including a Druidic lodge. When you look at a photograph of the three main characters involved at the Yalta Conference in February 1945, keep in mind that all three were Freemasons. The United Nations was the second prearranged attempt at world government offered as the solution to future conflicts like World War II. To help prevent the pivotal United States from backing out of the United Nations as it did with the League of Nations, the UN was to be located on American soil with land graciously donated by John D. Rockefeller Jr. Through its domination of the American media, the CFR conditioned the United States to accept the increasing role of the UN in the drive for world government. Political Zionism, a tool of the Rothschilds, clearly expressed the desire to create Israel long before World War II. This is documented in the Balfour Declaration of 1917. 
Arthur James Balfour of the British Foreign Office announced that it was the will of His Majesty's government to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This official policy was given to the World Zionist Federation of Great Britain, headed by Lord Rothschild, over 30 years before Israel was created. James Balfour, a willing tool of the British Freemasonic crown, was awarded many Masonic royal titles for this and other services rendered. Political Zionism used and magnified the anti-Semitism of the Nazi movement to create Israel. As soon as Hitler took power in 1933, many Jews around the world boycotted German goods. The political Zionists in Palestine negotiated a secret deal with the devil. In return for the transfer of 60,000 Jews and $100 million to Palestine, political Zionists would halt the worldwide Jewish-led anti-Nazi boycott that threatened to topple the Hitler regime in its first year. Over 40 million Chinese died in a 25-year period under the dictatorship of Mao Zedong, yet all you probably know is the phrase, six million Jews. If you question the scope and purpose of the Holocaust, you will be labeled a Holocaust denier. The Holocaust of the Jews has been ground into the public consciousness by the political Zionists who used and inflated its horror to justify their goal. Theodore Herzl's dream was realized when the flag he proposed, based on the Rothschild hexagram, flew over Israel in May 1948. To this day, I don't know what happened on August 2nd and August 4th, 1964 in the Tonkin Gulf. The general provided the answer, saying his Navy attacked the Maddox on August 2nd, but on the 4th, nothing happened. There was absolutely nothing, he said. The revelation may be important to historians. They have argued for years that the second incident on August 4th never occurred. But Lyndon Johnson used it to justify air attacks on Vietnam and broaden the scope of the war. Events afterwards showed that our judgment that we'd been attacked that day was wrong. It didn't happen. The initial attack on the destroyer Maddox on August 2nd was repeated today by a number of hostile vessels attacking two U.S. destroyers with torpedoes. Repeated acts of violence against the armed forces of the United States must be met not only with alert defense, but with positive reply. The wars against Asian communism for 30 years were symptoms of a much larger problem. The problem was that the Illuminati financiers were using a new dialectic to control the world. By pitting the capitalist West against the communist East, the world was locked in a state of bipolar tension with little chance of truly breaking free. The arms race between America and Russia was the best symbol of this tension. Russia was given the tools and technology to make the atom bomb by the American establishment in 1944. In spite of this, Russia and America spent over $5 trillion on weapons that would have guaranteed mutually assured destruction many times over. In his closing speech to the nation in January 1961, President Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women 
are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. We didn't listen to him then. We still aren't listening now. The Illuminati financiers planned for the failure of communism. Communism as a system is guaranteed to fail without support. It failed in 1989 through the symbology of the fall of the Berlin Wall. China was busy by this time producing goods for the capitalist West. In 50 years, the planet went from a multipolar world to a bipolar world to a monopolar world. In the meantime, three more secret societies emerged to help manage the planet without your awareness or consent. The time to encourage another war would soon be around the corner. The Bilderberg Group got its name from the Bilderberg Hotel in Osterbeek, Holland, the site of the group's first modern meeting. It was founded by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands in 1954, though its practices can be traced back to the Knights Templar. The Bilderberg Group was originally concerned with a regional Europe for the benefit of its members at the expense of national sovereignty. Over time, its scope has broadened to include balanced membership mainly from NATO countries. Many members of the CFR are also members of the Bilderberg Group. Once a year in five-star hotels between Europe and North America, around a hundred influential people gather together to determine the future of the planet for the next one or two years. The membership and accomplishments of the Bilderberg Group have been impressive. Presidents are chosen by this group. When Queen Beatrix and David Rockefeller get together at a Bilderberg meeting, you are looking at the two people on the planet who control the lion's share of the world's oil supply. The 2008 oil price and credit boom and bust were planned events according to leaks from the Bilderberg Group in 2006. The Bilderberg Group also created the European Union. The Club of Rome promotes peace and prosperity, but does so in a way that advances world government at the expense of national sovereignty. It was founded in April 1968 by Aurelio Pecci, a prominent Italian industrialist. Affiliations with the Club of Rome have included members of the Rockefeller family and the CFR. Of all the globalist organizations we have encountered so far, the Club of Rome is the group which is the most heavily involved in the New Age movement, regardless of its size. This group specializes in promoting neo-feudalism to justify social and economic control. The Trilateral Commission was created in 1973 by David Rockefeller to launder money. As more congressmen and informed citizens became aware of the CFR and the Federal Reserve during the 1950s and 60s, global planners realized that they had to be more covert. Their American and European money would have to be sent to Japanese industrialists and Arab oil magnates who would use it to buy up Western businesses and real estate. With this system in place, 
economic woes in the West resulting from the globalists' control could then be blamed on the Japanese and Arabs. Arab leaders who couldn't agree on anything for centuries suddenly came together to create the OPEC oil embargo of 1973. High gas prices made the Americans flock to Japanese cars. This system of Western, Eastern, and Middle Eastern trade promoted global interdependence and made lots of money. Saddam Hussein became the new target of the Illuminati financiers with the collapse of communism in 1989. White House Special Envoy Donald Rumsfeld met Saddam in December 1983. Rumsfeld gave Saddam the gas he used to kill thousands of his own people, but that didn't matter to the elite. What did matter was that Saddam was pumping too much oil to get rid of his foreign debt. This lowered oil prices by flooding the oil market, angering OPEC nations. It also lowered the value of the U.S. dollar because it was the world's reserve currency and oil is traded in U.S. dollars. Saddam was becoming independent and had to be stopped. U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, April Glaspie, met Saddam in July 1990. When Saddam asked the ambassador what the American response would be if he were to invade Kuwait, the ambassador replied, We have no opinion on the Arab-Arab conflicts, such as your dispute with Kuwait. Saddam bit on the bait and invaded Kuwait one month later. Operation Desert Storm followed in five months in January 1991. Saddam's army was destroyed in five weeks. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. We are now led to understand that there are also firings in another city in Saudi Arabia. Uh, CNN's Carl Rochelle is, is here with me. He just came up. Uh, Carl, I know we can't be very specific given these restrictions, but uh, within those parameters, what did you see? Well, what I saw, I, I didn't see anything hit. I looked very, almost straight above us. There is a vapor trail coming from my right to my left, and there's a cloud of uh, something. It looks like it might have been an explosion, a cloud. Uh, oh, I'd say... It, it, I just, my, my apologies for that. He's uh, putting on a gas mask. There hasn't been any gas dropped here that we could tell. You uh, smell anything? No. Oh. You, probably, you may smell some of the fumes from uh, a, uh, a missile exhaust going off. Je suis un journaliste américain. <laughs> Oh, I love this country so much. You guys just don't have a clue. This is a Scud. You can tell it by its distinctive label. Now, when the missile is launched, the first thing you look for is the plume sticking out behind it. Now, when you detect this, you can tell it's been launched. Thank you. Have you sniffed any rocket fumes lately? Very good thing you got a gas mask around, bud? Oh, I get it. Um, oh, I see. That's good. And I thought it was.
They took the babies out of the incubators. Took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. And they had kids in incubators and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. It's a proud day for America, and by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. Saddam's baited invasion meant that the nation of Iraq and its rich oil reserves could be held indefinitely as ransom by the globalists from 1991 onwards. But this was not enough for the elite. George Herbert Walker Bush, member of Bohemian Grove and Skull and Bones, whose father helped finance the Nazis, signaled the intention of the Illuminati. His New World Order speech to Congress was given on September 11, 1990, exactly 11 years before another staged event. The crisis in the Persian Gulf, as grave as it is, also offers a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective a new world order can emerge. People are still bewildered by what happened on September 11, 2001. This brief study cross-examines the mechanics, the men involved, and the motives for what happened on that day. Most people assume that Flight 93 was crashed by its passengers after they overtook the terrorists who controlled it. After all, it left a scar in the earth. Here's the problem. According to a USGS aerial survey, that scar existed in 1994 or earlier. At this point, we have two choices. We can choose to believe that a full-sized airliner being fought over can crash into topsoil in precise alignment with a pre-existing scar, leaving that scar relatively intact. We can also choose to believe that only part of the plane landed within that scar. The first option would violate the patterns of hundreds of airplane crashes over decades. The second option forces us to ask whether pieces of the plane were found in other locations. Indeed, this is the case. Small pieces of the plane were spread out over a debris field several miles long. This forces us to ask how the plane disintegrated. According to retired Colonel Don de Grand Pre, it was shot down by a member of the Air Force. We have since learned the probable name of the pilot who eliminated Flight 93. Lieutenant Colonel Rick Gibney was the only pilot in the United States Air Force to be given an award in secret for his actions on a special mission on 9-11. Most people assume that Flight 77 struck the Pentagon with no warning by a crack pilot. In recorded testimony before the 9-11 Commission, then Transportation Secretary Norman Mineta recalled what he witnessed in the Presidential Command Center below the White House. During the time then, the airplane coming in to the Pentagon uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? This testimony proves that the Vice President was aware that something was approaching the Pentagon. Hani Hanor is alleged to have hijacked Flight 77 and flown it into the Pentagon. Here's the problem. The flight parameters for Flight 77, obtained under the Freedom of Information Act from the National Transportation Safety Board, indicate that the flight deck door remained closed once the plane was in flight. The mid-air hijacking of Flight 77 could not have taken place if the cockpit door never opened. One of the popular myths of 9-11 is that the Twin Towers were towering infernos. If that's true, then people wouldn't have been told to return to work in the South Tower. In the neighboring South Tower, people are also evacuating. But an announcement over the PA system tells workers their building is secure 
and they can return to their desks, an announcement that will soon have tragic consequences. If the towers were towering infernos, then the Battalion 7 chief would have never been able to make it to the 78th floor and say, if the tower fires were melting steel columns, then Edna Sintron wouldn't have been able to wave from the plane impact zone with her light pants not even singed. The collapse of Building 7 forces us to consider other possibilities for the collapse of the Twin Towers. Here's the problem. Building 7 was not hit by a plane and not splashed with burning jet fuel, yet at 5.20 p.m. on September 11th, Building 7 fell exactly like the Twin Towers did. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. The most logical explanation for the building collapses on September 11th is the most outrageous, through the use of explosives. All explosives leave residues. A 2009 peer-reviewed scientific paper has been published in the Open Chemical Physics Journal proving that explosive residues of specialized thermite which could only have been made in advanced military labs, were found in preserved dust samples from the remains of the buildings. Jet fuel is premium-grade kerosene which cannot melt steel. Thermite is a mixture of iron oxide and aluminum. When ignited, it burns at over 2,500 degrees Celsius to instantly liquefy steel. There is plenty of evidence that thermite was used on that day and that it kept reacting for weeks after the buildings collapsed. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like molten line. steel running down the channel wheels, like you're in a foundry, mm -hmm. yeah. like lava. Like, like, like lava. lava. Volcano. In addition to thermite, two other types of explosives were used to level three buildings on 9/11. The job of the shape charge is to cut steel H beams. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle, which, through a series of beams cut at the same angle, will tend to make the building shift over and walk. Shape charges were used to slice through posts at an angle, not straight across, for a reason. We made it outside, we made it about a block. We made it at least two blocks, two blocks. and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, as detonated. As if they were planned to yeah. take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. Based on the evidence, the final roll sequences after pre-weakening with thermite and shape charges was most likely done with nuclear explosives. Don't think of Hiroshima. If the United States Army was loading nuclear shells by hand into howitzers 50 years ago, what do you think is available in the 21st century? The evidence for the use of nuclear explosives on 9-11 is substantial. A government report tried to spin the appearance of the radioactive isotope tritium at ground zero in concentrations dozens of times higher than the surrounding area. Hundreds of cars at ground zero burst into flames from the inside out. This is explained with a characteristic electromagnetic pulse of nuclear explosions overloading the vehicle's electronics, causing the vehicles to ignite. 
it would be foolish to conclude that aviation-grade kerosene would cause this kind of selective damage while leaving truckloads of loose paper around the site untouched. Toxic fumes produced by fires from the continuously reacting thermite and radiation from the final roll sequences explain why 7 out of 10 people with significant exposure to ground zero are dying from a host of illnesses. If explosives were used to destroy buildings on 9-11, they would have had to be placed in the buildings. This is made easier when there was an unprecedented power down in the World Trade Center complex for alleged electronic upgrades on the weekend before September 11, 2001. Is it just a coincidence that the president's brother, Marvin Bush, was on the board of directors for the firm providing security at the World Trade Center? Is it also a coincidence that the firm's contract with the World Trade Center ended on September 10, 2001? The so-called terrorists who attacked America without warning were trained and lived at U.S. military bases. The radical Islamic terrorists of 9-11 got drunk in a Florida bar, paying for their drinks with a wad of cash. Some of the terrorists who died in 9-11 have turned up alive and well. The 9-11 terrorist list has not been updated. Documents reveal that Osama's CIA codename was Tim Osman. This leads us back to Zbigniew Brzezinski because he created the Mujahideen in the late 1970s, which were later renamed Al-Qaeda. The people of Pakistan know what the U.S. will never admit to, that Osama bin Laden is a CIA asset. Who is Osama bin Laden? Who? He's, a, he's just a character created by America. Actually, 98% of Pakistan would probably follow along, those, along the same line. They believe that Osama is basically a CIA agent who is working undercover to uh, put a bad image of Islam. Really? So that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. This is assuming that Osama is still alive and that the conveniently timed release of new Osama recordings aren't faked. This brings us to why 9-11 occurred. James R. Bath met George W. Bush during their time at the Texas Air National Guard. Both were kicked out for being AWOL. Through a trust agreement created in July 1976, James Bath was authorized to invest money from Salem bin Laden father of Osama bin Laden. This was at the time when George Bush Sr. was director of the CIA. Three years later, James Bath bought 25,000 shares in Arbusto 79 Limited, George Bush Jr.'s oil company. The Bushes do business with the bin Ladens. The Saudi bin Laden group makes its money from being the main construction conglomerate of the House of Saud. The Saudis make their money from supplying oil to America to create an artificial demand for the US dollar. Oil, the dollar, and war, the House of Saud, the House of Bush, and the House of Bin Laden are all connected. George Bush Sr. was a member of the Carlyle Group, a venture capital firm heavily invested in arms sales. On the morning of September 11, 2001, George H. W. Bush was president when the Carlyle Group hosted a conference at a Washington hotel. Among the guests of honor was a valued investor, Shafiq bin Laden, brother to Osama. Operation Northwoods is the name of a top secret report produced in 1962 by the highest ranking military officer in the United States. This report remained classified for nearly 40 years and for good reason. It suggested that the United States military should attack America under a system of pretexts. The attack would then be blamed on Cuba as an excuse to invade Cuba. The details of this report are staggering. Items inside a military base could be blown up and burnt. 
a ship at harbor could be sabotaged by starting large fires with naphthalene. Funerals for mock victims could be conducted. A modified military plane could be substituted for a civilian plane and loaded with passengers under carefully prepared aliases. The military aircraft would then be converted to a drone. The United States military planned to attack America in 1962 using remote controlled aircraft to justify invading Cuba. Fast forward to 9-11. Because the cockpit door of Flight 77 never opened in flight, this is exactly what happened on 9-11. Now you can never say they'd never think of that. They thought of that in 1962. They thought about it again in 2001. The Project for a New American Century is a neoconservative think tank. Some of its members are the most powerful people in the United States. In a report dated September 2000, one year before 9-11, this group wanted to turn the United States military into a vehicle of global domination. You may doubt this interpretation until you turn to page 60. Here, we read that advanced forms of biological warfare that can target specific genotypes may transform biological warfare from the realm of terror to a politically useful tool. This report noted that this transformation would trouble American allies and would take a long time, absent a catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. The goal of the war on terror is to make loads of money and to accelerate the next great dialectical war. Insurgents keep being captured, but some of them turn out to be MI5 agents. Over 30,000 troops are being used to fight 100 Al-Qaeda soldiers. Members of Al-Qaeda are being trained at U.S. military bases. Opium is flowing from Afghanistan. The lies are so thick that bricks of cash are being given out to soldiers to keep them quiet. The Illuminati do not want peace. They want more wars. I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew, and I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. He's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event. Never told him what the event was going to be, but there was going to be an event, and out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East, and make it all part of the New World Order. And uh, sure enough, later, 9-11 happened. And I remember he was telling me how, <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places. And, it's, and there's going to be this war on terror, uh, which is no real enemy. And the whole thing is a giant hoax, you know, but it's a way for the government to take over the American people. And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society, to have the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. In earlier times, it was easier to control a million people than physically to kill a million people. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. He has proven to be an outstanding friend uh, and somebody who I've learned an immense amount from. Uh, and for him to support me in this campaign and then uh, be willing to come out uh, here to Iowa is a testimony to his generosity. So if everybody could please give Dr. Brzezinski another round of applause. So far, we have learned that over 5,000 years of ancient mystery religions have filtered themselves into Illuminized Freemasonry by the mid to late 1700s. We have learned that every major war since the French Revolution has been manipulated through the Hegelian dialectic to provide more control to the Illuminati. 
We have also learned that Israel was an Illuminati creation. But where are we going from here? What does the Bible say about this? And what should we do about it? The book of Revelation is filled with a lot of imagery, much of which can be confusing to those who haven't studied it thoroughly. This imagery is a necessary tool used by someone nearly 2,000 years ago trying to describe the complexity of events in our time. Fortunately, the book of Revelation explains a lot of its imagery. Revelation chapter 17 describes a system of world government where a woman rides a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Apparently, the world will be divided up at some future point into ten kingdoms. The truly astonishing part is that this division is happening now. In September 1973, the Club of Rome issued a report entitled Regionalized and Adaptive Model of the Global World System. It proposed dividing the world into ten kingdoms. Yes, it actually used the phrase ten kingdoms. While the boundaries of these ten kingdoms are subject to change, it is their proposal that is the point. Since that proposal in 1973, the world is being divided into ten kingdoms. It started with the European Union. It is continuing with the African Union. It is now here with the North American Union, or NAU. Our elected political leaders in North America deny the existence of the NAU, calling it a conspiracy theory. They do so while the Queen's representative in my province of Manitoba lays out its infrastructure. Can you say today that this is not a prelude to a North American Union, similar to a European Union? Uh, are there plans to build some kind of superhighway connecting all three countries? And do you believe all of these theories about a possible erosion of national identity stem from a lack of transparency from this partnership? A couple of my opposition leaders have speculated on massive water diversions and uh, uh, superhighways to the continent, maybe interplanetary, I'm not sure as well. Manitoba is also taking a major role in the development of a mid-continent trade corridor, connecting our northern port of Churchill with trade markets throughout the central U.S. and Mexico. I I'm amused by some of the, some of the speculation uh, some of the old, uh, you call them political scare tactics. If you've been in politics as long as I have, you get used to that kind of technique where you lay out a conspiracy and then force people to try to prove it doesn't exist. And that's just the way some people operate. An alliance has been built with business leaders and state and city governments spanning the entire length of the corridor. When fully developed, the trade route will incorporate an inland port in Winnipeg with pre-clearance for international shipping. I'm amused by the difference between what actually takes place in the meetings and what some are trying to you know, say takes place. It's, a, it's quite comical, actually, when you realize the difference between reality and what some people are talking on TV about. And we cannot be effective at major economic matters any, any longer unless we work with our other economic partners around the world and work with them closely and intimately. That is essential. I know some people don't like it. It's a loss of national sovereignty, but it is a simple reality. A lot of people are wondering about the future of America. Many students of Bible prophecy are beginning to reconsider the possible identity of the woman who rides the beast of a one-world government system. Revelation 17.1 talks about the punishment of a great prostitute who sits on many waters. Revelation 17.15 explains the imagery of the waters to mean many peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. In Revelation 17.18, the woman or prostitute is clearly defined as the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So far, the whore of Babylon is a dominant multicultural city. New York is a dominant multicultural city. New York is also home to the United Nations, the premier organization of world government. Revelation 18, 11 to 13 
lists the many items you can get from this city. They say you can get whatever you want in New York. Look at the last two items in this list, which are slaves or the bodies and souls of men. This verse is amazingly accurate. The United States was allowed to become the world's biggest debtor nation when it became bankrupt in 1933, eventually along with all other nations, because your birth certificate is a bond. You are pledged as collateral on the debt of your nation. You are traded as a human resource on the stock exchanges of the world, especially in New York, the home to the world's largest stock exchange. At the entrance to New York stands the prostitute who sits on many waters, holding a golden cup in her hand. The prostitute has seven heads, or seven rays of initiation, radiating from her crown. The prostitute is none other than Queen Semiramis, the ancient queen of Babylon. I know you doubt this, but at the base of the Statue of Liberty is a plaque. It states that the statue is a gift from the Freemasons of France to the Freemasons of America. Revelation 18.15 talks about the merchants of the world who gained their wealth from her, standing amazed at her destruction. Revelation 18.17 describes the woman being consumed by fire in one hour. Whether or not the biblical description of Babylon applies to New York today or Iraq tomorrow is a moot point. The point is that because New York fits the Babylonian archetype, or sign of things to come, we should expect that New York should suffer the same fate as Babylon. If my interpretation of Babylon and its destruction is correct, then there ought to be signs of secret societies in America preparing for its destruction. Perhaps the greatest sign of America's pending destruction is on the back of the US $1 bill. You have been told that the bird on the right is an eagle. That's not what Manly P. Hall viewed it as. He knew that it was a phoenix, the ancient mythological bird of fiery rebirth. The phoenix is used to describe how old systems of power are deliberately destroyed to produce new systems of power. The system of power that is being built now is described on the left side on the back of the US $1 bill. You have been told that the Latin phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum means a new order of the ages. If you understood what the Roman poet Virgil meant when he wrote what this phrase is based on, you would know that it means the same thing as Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. For the meaning of that, you will have to wait until volume 3. For now, it means God hath favored our undertakings, new order secular, or New World Order. The occult purpose of America is to usher in the New World Order on the back of what appears to be a trusted democracy. This purpose is hidden in plain sight. The New World Order is coordinated on a spiritual level by Lucifer, who is Satan disguised as an angel of light. Once you understand that, then everything makes sense. Lenin's associate, Mikhail Bakunin, was under a satanic influence. A satanic theme saturated the poetry of Karl Marx. Perhaps the best quote about the Luciferian agenda comes from Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name given to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the sun of the morning, is it he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. The devil is very real. His main disguise is well described. This is not just because Bible thumpers say so, but because anti-Christians say so. I'm a Christian, sir. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything about, about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, is he the Lucifer that God created? 
That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. No. And you're, hey, what you're about confirming those hospitals? It. They, they, they you know what, sir? <clears throat> Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not, we did not do these good deeds in your name. And you'll say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus said it? In Matthew chapter 5. Mercy. No. That's hard to believe. So you're that a Christian and you don't know that. Actually. No, I really am. Giuseppe Mazzini and Albert Pike often wrote to each other. After all, they were the heads of Freemasonry in Europe and America for their time. In a letter from Albert Pike to Giuseppe Mazzini, dated August 15, 1871, the plan to consolidate the world under the direction of Lucifer through three world wars was laid out. The First World War must be brought about in order to permit the Illuminati to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia and of making that country a fortress of atheistic communism. The divergences caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the British and the Germanic empires will be used to foment this war. At the end of the war, communism will be built and be used to destroy the other governments and in order to weaken the religions. The Second World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences between the fascists and the political Zionists. This war must be brought about so that Nazism is destroyed and that the political Zionism is strong enough to institute a sovereign state of Israel in Palestine. During the Second World War, international communism must become strong enough in order to balance Christendom, which will then be restrained and held in check until the time when we would need it for the final social cataclysm. The Third World War must be fomented by taking advantage of the differences caused by the agents of the Illuminati between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world. This war must be conducted in such a way that Islam and political Zionism mutually destroy each other. Meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual, and economical exhaustion. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm which, in all its horror, will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil. The multitude, disillusioned with Christianity, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer brought finally out into the public view. This will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Many people around the world today are particularly concerned with Israel. The Bible said 2,600 years ago in Ezekiel 37 that before the third and final great war, Jews from around the world will begin to be gathered back to Israel, even in unbelief. Israel has offered cash and land to Iranian Jews to move to Israel. Iranian Jews have refused this offer, saying that they preferred life in Iran. This is one of the many examples which prove that when governments of the world try to force Bible prophecy, it doesn't work. The Bible promises that there will be several great wars over Israel in the future. You can read about them in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation 19. They are remarkably like Albert Pike's vision, except with one major important twist. What Albert Pike did not understand is that God is not in the habit of breaking his promises to Israel. God is also not in the habit of rewriting his promises to Israel or any of his prophecies. Christians understand this. Over a billion Muslims do not. Today, Israel is a paradox. America and Christianity are loyal to Israel, but Israel isn't loyal to America and to Christianity. Evidence shows that Israel assisted the United States 
in the 9-11 attacks on itself so that America would be justified in retribution against Israel's enemies. And all of a sudden, down there, I see this van park. And I see three guys on top of the van. And I could see that they were, like, happy. You know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me. I just happened to see the van and, you know, hollered over to my lieutenant. You know, I think that could be the van. We checked it out, and it was. You know, we were all on edge, obviously, so I really wasn't looking to make friends with these people, and neither were the officers that I were with. Once we started talking to them, you know, they were pretty much like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're not against you, we're with you. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. Most directory assistance calls and virtually all call records and billing in the U.S. are done for the phone companies by Amdocs Limited, an Israeli-based private telecommunications company. Amdocs has contracts with the 25 biggest phone companies in America and more worldwide. Since September 11th, more than 60 Israelis have been arrested or detained, either under the new Patriot anti-terrorism law or for immigration violations. A handful of active Israeli military were among those detained, according to investigators, who say some of the detainees also failed polygraph questions when asked about alleged surveillance activities against and in the United States. Building is going to collapse. Nothing information. Building is going to collapse. Nothing information. Investigators suspect that the Israelis may have gathered intelligence about the attacks in advance and not shared it. A highly placed investigator said there are, quote, tie-ins. But when asked for details, he flatly refused to describe them, saying, quote, evidence linking these Israelis to 911 is classified. I cannot tell you about evidence that has been gathered. It's classified information. Some mainline TV preachers are bending over backwards trying to justify Israel's every move to the point where their teachings are anti-biblical. In defense of Israel will shape Christian theology. It scripturally proves that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. It will also prove that Jesus did not come to earth to be the Messiah. It will prove that there was a Calvary conspiracy between Rome, the high priest and Herod to execute Jesus as an insurrectionist too dangerous to live. Since Jesus refused by word and deed to claim to be the Messiah, how can the Jews be blamed for rejecting what was never offered? Read it in this shocking expose in defense of Israel. The modern recreation of Israel is causing something to happen that the political Zionists did not intend. Just as the Bible said would happen, many Israelis are beginning to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. היום חיים כבר בינינו כ-15,000 יהודים משיחיים מאמינים, מאמינים בישוע, מתפללים אליו אבל גם מלים את בניהם, נשקים את המזוזה ומתגייסים לצה"ל במוטיבציה מלאה. שלמה רז פגש בהם וחזר קצת מבולבל. אבל כל זה לא משכנע כמובן חוגים חרדים שנלחמים בהם מלחמת חורמה. <אז> זוהי הפגנה שארגנו חסידי גור בערד נגד הקהילה המקומית. הנה הרים כפניי בא ממשפחה חרדית, חטפו אותה, עשו ממנה נוצרייה. הם חוטפים ילדים ומטפילים אותם לנצרות, תתרחקו מהם. כשהאמונה יוקדת, אין מה שיעצור את התופעה. בשנים האחרונות יש גידול משמעותי במספר הקהילות של היהודים המשיחיים. מדברים לפחות על 15 קהילות רק בירושלים. אפילו באזור הזה, גבול השכונות החרדיות, פועלות כמה קהילות של יהודים משיחיים. הקהילה הזאת, שמן ששון שמה, פועלת במרכז ירושלים. בניגוד לכל הקהילות האחרות שפנינו עליהן, היא הסכימה להיחשף למצלמות. 
הקהילה הזאת צמחה בשנתיים מ-60 מאמינים לכ-200. רבים מהמצטרפים החדשים הם צעירים, ילידי הארץ, חלקם מבתים מסורתיים. התפילה היא יסוד מרכזי אצל המשיחים. כל אחד מתפלל מתי שבא לו ואיך שבא לו, אין נוסח תפילות מחייב. רוצים שנדע שהאמונה היא שקושרת אותם לארץ הזאת, שאין סתירה על פי אמונתם בין הברית החדשה לבין התנ״ך, להפך, שאפשר להתפלל לישו, ישוע בלשונם. ובמקביל, לקבל את השבת כמו שמקבלים אותה במיליוני בתים יהודים ברחבי העולם. There is a massive spiritual point behind the recreation of Israel. Most of the world's power will continue to return westward at an accelerating pace to where it began, the Middle East. The heart of the Middle East is Israel. The heart of Israel is Jerusalem. The heart of Jerusalem is the Jewish temple. The Bible says that Satan is the prince of this world. The Bible also says that Satan's greatest desire is to be worshipped as the God of all religions in the temple of God. We are very close to the rebuilding of that temple. There is no way that a Jewish temple could be rebuilt in the middle of the Muslim world without a Jewish state. There is no way that a Jewish state could have been established in that world without the UN creating it in response to the Holocaust. There is also no way that the Holocaust or Israel could have occurred without political Zionism. Here is a mystery. Evil has no choice but to follow Bible prophecy. This gives all those who follow the Bible hope for the future. It also poses a major problem for atheists and agnostics. People in these camps blame God or people's idea of God for most of the evil in this world. It would never occur to these groups that all this time it was Satan manipulating people and trying to imitate God who was responsible for most of the evil in this world. Ultimately, Satan is God's tool. For all those who think that the Bible was written by secret societies to fool the world into believing that God is in control of it, keep one thing in mind. The New World Order couldn't control all aspects of one major event. Do you really think that secret societies could arrange hundreds of events over thousands of years? The origin of the evil in this world today is not Freemasonry or Frankism, the Illuminati or the Rothschilds, America or Israel, or any other group or movement. The source of the evil in this world today is sin. Sin is doing what is wrong or not doing what is right according to God's rules. The problem with God's rules is not the rules. It's that no one in the physical or spiritual worlds are inclined to follow them. Satan got humanity to break God's rules through lies. People join secret societies because they think they will not die and because they think that special knowledge will make them be like gods, knowing good and evil. These two lies from Satan have not changed in over 6,000 years. We need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best, starting with the preparation of our souls. There are plenty of guidelines on what to do that are prudent and not paranoid. Your elderly parents or grandparents knew what to do. You wouldn't call them paranoid. As you prepare, count your blessings. A final word to Christians. Did you think you could elect Jesus into office? The New World Order owns both sides of the political spectrum. The heart of man is full of evil. It's time to be more socially active and less politically dependent, never forgetting the gospel of Christ. The Americans round up people from the nearby town and force them to witness the horrors that have been committed in their name. 18-year-old Renata Simon. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. They had piled up the corpses of people who had died. The smell was just 
too much. I couldn't take it anymore. But the GI shouted at me, You Hitler Fräulein, here look, look. Both America and Israel were dedicated to God. Did you ever think that Satan wouldn't have a plan for these two countries? It's time for reform instead of rejection or blind religion. Pray for our countries and institutions and work to reform them. We can get a reprieve just as Nineveh did. A final word to those who are still on the fence. The devil owns the fence. The devil's greatest trick is to appear as an angel of light. He attracts you to him and blinds you with confusing issues like astrotheology and Bible inconsistency, even though consistent copies of the Bible are being discovered all the time. It's time to stop the lies. Tell me, have you ever lied? That makes you a liar, doesn't it? Have you ever stolen anything? Even some candy as a kid? That makes you a thief, doesn't it? Out of your own heart, you admit that you're a lying thief. You're no better than any member of any secret society. You deserve the punishment that you demand all the tyrants of history get. Do you want to defeat the New World Order? Do so one soul at a time, starting with your own. It's time to embrace the truth. Admit that you're a sinner and that you can't reconcile your life with God on your own. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son who died for your sins. Confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Tell somebody. Dedicate yourself to knowing more about God. Start by reading 1 John near the back of the Bible. It's only four pages long. Then read the New Testament. As you do, find a Bible-believing church. If you get a chance to ask some ministers who Jesus is and they don't say something like, God's son who died for you, move on. They are part of the problem. If Lucifer is a Christian myth, then why are so many anti-Christians dedicated to Lucifer? Lucifer isn't concerned with Moses or Muhammad. He is concerned with trying to be what he could never be, the capstone of heaven. Don't be fooled. Choose who you will serve today.
of money He's got a good job Can he buy his way out? When his world crashes in The high places fall they cry The highest may low The humble may high The high places fall The idols they cry The highest may low The humble may high When the towers fall And life crumbles away Towers fall and life crumbles away.